We could win this war. We can win this war? OK, well, joining us from Orlando, Florida, is the man in that clip, Anthony Dream Johnson, who says he wants to abolish feminism and make women great again. No, but he also crazy. says, with a trademark, make women great again for women. Always, Always great. great. Right. Make women great again. But they're going to do a three-day seminar for women led by all men. <laughs> in mansplaining news, a three-day conference for women led by men hopes to make women great again. How the 22 convention will make you the greatest you ever. Raise your femininity by 500%. First of all, how is a man supposed to tell a woman how to be the ultimate woman? But women need to be taught how to be great again. Oh, not my yes, words. We do. Not like my... how to land a husband, <gasps> how to lose weight, how to pop out a bunch of kids. Why do men think they need to fix the problems of women? Well, it says the world's ultimate event for women. Yeah, Orlando, Florida, that's going to be the scene of the crime. It's mansplaining palooza. And say no to the toxic bullying feminist dogma. <laughs> Taught by men to make women great again. Taking the stage now is the founder of the 22 Convention. You're in for a treat, Mr. Anthony Dream Johnson. Anthony Dream Johnson. Anthony Dream Johnson. The first president of the Manosphere. It's run by all men, Surprise. which promises to, quote, make women great again. This course is guaranteed to raise your femininity by 500%. Together, we will make women great again. Excuse me, I'm mansplaining here. She said there's nothing... Welcome to the 22 convention, the first one that's part of the 21 Summit in Orlando, Florida. The year 2020, I am happy to introduce to you one of my favorite speakers of this convention. He's going to introduce himself, what his background, his credentials, and why he's here. I was a big fan of him, probably couple years ago, and I knew that he was going to end up on the stage here. Put your hands together for Pastor Michael Foster. Well, good afternoon, ladies. I'm, I'm privileged to be here. Uh, why am I here? I'll tell you some more in a second, but my wife, I told her this thing was happening, and she said, uh, you should go speak at 22 as long as you bring me back a hat. Make sure it's a blue one. So the first thing I did when I got here is I got one of the Make Women Great Again blue hats, and I'm really happy to be with you guys. I am a, a father, a husband, a pastor. I'm a Presbyterian pastor, getting ready to plant a church on the east side of Cincinnati. I've been married to my wife for just shy of 18 years. We started dating in high school, and God has blessed us with uh, eight children. And so it's a busy household, and it's uh, always fun. And I want to get right into the, the main reason I'm speaking to women today and why I actually even care about this topic. And it goes back to about 10 years ago when uh, I was in the kitchen. We were living in Bloomington, Indiana, and uh, we lived in a small apartment at the time. We had our first uh, three kids, the boys, Hudson, Athanasius, and Cademan. And uh, my wife was pregnant with a girl. And a girl is a big deal uh, in my family. There's about 17 cousins on my dad's side. And I think three of them are girls. So all our swimmers are males. And I didn't ever think we would get a girl, right? But uh, Emily was pregnant with my daughter, Nicaea. Uh, we are just like two weeks away from having this baby. And it was very exciting. Uh, we do home birth. We're like some of those weird people that like to have the baby at home where all the uh, germs are our germs instead of deadly germs elsewhere. But. Um, so we were prepping for the home birth, and our midwife, Gay, was over there. And what I heard her say in the other room, because we were getting ready to go to the Monroe County Fair, right? We're going to get on Ferris wheels and eat elephant ears and have a good time. And so we're all rushing around trying to get ready for this and trying to fit in this midwife visit at the same time. So Gay has the Doppler on my wife's stomach. And what I hear her say is, where's the heartbeat? Right? That's the first thing I hear. And I'm like, come again. So I walk out of the, the kitchen, and I said, what are you talking about? And, uh, well, we're having trouble finding the heartbeat, right? So they're moving their Doppler around on the belly with the jelly and all that stuff, trying to find that. 
you know, and, uh, and they can't find the heartbeat. So maybe it's a Doppler, right? But it's, it's, it's not looking good. So, but it's got to be the Doppler. You know, my wife, we've had all our kids at home. Uh, she's, she's a very healthy, strong woman, good genes. She drinks wine at night and eats a sleeve of Oreos and doesn't get fat. I tell her it's going to destroy you eventually. So she's starting to stop that. But um, so we all get everyone into the minivan and we drive over to our, uh, our backup doctor to go in and, and, and have a closer look. And uh, we walk in and they, they look and, and Nicaea, she's, she's dead. Um, her heart has stopped in the middle of the night. Um, I don't even know why what caused it, and uh, so I walk outside, um, and I just, you know, howl, right, like scream, because now it's my job as a husband and father to be the one that people can depend on, because Emily was in a state of shock, um, a state that she would stay in for a, a long time, and so we uh, go to the hospital, and my wife has to give birth to a, a corpse, to a, to a dead body. That's how it works. And uh, so we, had to, we debated whether or not we would wait for the baby to come out naturally or we'd actually um, induce. We decided to induce to move, move through this uh, pain. And so we do that. Uh, and a couple hours later, uh, my daughter is born dead. She comes out, and she's, she's white, and she's covered in blood, and she looks identical to my wife. Identical. You know, this was this crowning moment, right? A daughter. After three sons, I love my sons. Our boys are great. But a daughter, right? To have a daughter. A daughter looks just like my wife. I love my wife. I want to replicate her into the world. Send more women like her out. And here she is, dead. A little version of her, right? It was, it was crushing. It was crushing to us. But it was even more eye opening because the background of this is that when we got pregnant with Cademan, it was, that's my third son. I was like, hey, uh, you know, be fruitful and multiply. But man, the, the, uh, the harvest is coming. Like, not, these aren't whole seasons. <laughs> you know, these are a lot of kids real quick. And as a man, I was scared. Can I take care of these kids? Can I provide for them? Can I, it's not just money, but can I father them well? And I was feeling my shortcomings. I, I didn't grow up a, a Christian. I didn't grow up in a, a healthy family. I grew up in a, a broken family. And the idea of like taking care of these kids, it was a, a, a huge responsibility. And it wasn't that I wanted to totally be done with kids, but uh, I wanted us to space it out a little bit. My wife, though, she wanted to have more kids. And I had done this deep study um, on birth control and, and the history of the doctrine of birth control and what does the church teach. And, and if you want to dive into it deep, the church has been against it the whole time. It wasn't until the 1930s that they started that to allow any form. But that's neither here nor there. I had become convicted that we should not salt our fields, that we should have sex and let it be fruitful sex, right? And, uh, and so I finally, like, you know, I'm like, yeah, let's keep having babies. I'll take care of all your babies. You can trust me, okay? And we get pregnant with this little girl, and she dies, right? And that's God reminding me that he opens and closes the womb. It's very, very easy to get complacent and to uh, assume things, right? You can assume that you can always have kids. You always hear this with young couples that they... Uh, you know, they're scared, like, hey, we don't want to start having kids. I mean, what, if we have a kid every year, by the time we die, we'll have 5,000 kids, right? They just think, like, babies are easy to make, right? But they're not, right? It's like a lot of people have all sorts of difficulties. And it was a huge rebuke to me that I took kids for granted. Now, what would you think? Now, do you think that would make us not want to have any more kids? It was so scarring. Not at all, right? Like... When you realize something like that's that precious, it can be stolen from you in a moment, it makes you want to have more. And, and this wasn't the plan, but we got pregnant just a couple months later, so we had what you call iris twins, right? We had two kids in 12 months, and, and that, pregnancy, that pregnancy was difficult because we were always scared, right? My wife was very scared, but, but then there she was, Galilee, a little girl, right? My little sweet girl at home. She's just like Emily. 
Uh, she's got uh, my blonde hair, but she's got everything else from Emily. So it's like, win. <laughs> and it was very healing to us. And, and I have since had two more daughters, Cedar and Cyrene. And so I have, uh, I have eight children, one in heaven, four boys and three girls. And uh, I'm very invested in women. <laughs> I married one. I love her. I think she's great. I have three daughters. I'm very concerned about the men they're going to marry and the sort of uh, mothers and wives they're going to be to my, my son-in-laws and my future grandchildren, concerned for my sons, that they would find a godly woman that would compliment them and build them up. And that's one of the reasons I'm here, okay? That's why I'm talking to women. That's why I want to encourage you in your femininity. And I want to encourage you because in the same way that I took kids for granted, uh, we have an entire culture that's taking femininity and in particular motherhood for granted. And the reason is, it's very simple. It's because um, feminism is the water we drink and the air we breathe. It's built into everything. And so, so it's kind of hard to see it at first. But then when you start to actually understand what, you know, feminists, oh, I thought feminism is just about being pro-woman. No, people were pro-women for a long time. People have loved their mothers since there was mothers, OK? Um, people love women. Women uh, weren't always oppressed under all these different patriarchies. That's just not true. Um, anyone that's actually read history, I studied history in college, got a couple of degrees. This is like truth. Like We know uh, how women were treated, and women have been rulers of countries. And, and Xenophon, he wrote a, a book, uh, which is a household code. It's a real ancient. Here's how you run your house, like an early self-help book. And then it, he said, without my wife, I would die. And it was like, oh, but it's not romantic. Like, he literally meant it, that the, her and his life were so essential to surviving and doing well. Without his wife, they would die, right? Without water, without shelter, without food, without his wife, they would die. And women have been precious for a long, long time. And you have a current narrative trying to tell you that's not true, to sow bitterness, to sow hatred, and to convince you that uh, motherhood is not a good thing. It's, it's somehow lower. And uh, I want to tell you that feminism is ultimately anti-feminine. It's, it's trying to get women to be like men. Your power is that you're not me, right? People uh, say, oh, my wife's my better half. I don't say that, right? And also people say, oh, do you have a feminine side? I don't, right? I have a feminine side like a dog has a feline side, right? Unless we're talking about my wife, right? My wife is my feminine half. She's my feminine side, and I need her. My household needs femininity. I, my sons need a mother, and my daughters need a mother, and I need her to uh, fulfill the, the command that God's given me to build a household for his glory. It takes two. When in Genesis it says it's not good for a man to be alone, we reinterpret that through the idea of like a soulmate, or like a woman completes a man, or a man completes a woman. That's not what it's talking about. The context is that God has told the whole human race, you can go look at Genesis uh, 128, to be fruitful and multiply, to rule and reign and subdue the earth. That's the command. And then he puts Adam in the garden, and then he, tell, he gives the command to Adam, and then Adam looks at all these animals, he's like, yeah, these animals can carry things or whatever, but it's... It's not, none of them are equal to him. None of them co complement him. And so God gives him a helpmate, he gives him a woman to fulfill that commandment, to, to build a household for God's glory. And in that sense, that's the sense that we complete each other. There's nothing lacking in a woman. She is a woman. There's nothing lacking in a man. But if they're going to build a home, a family together, we need both, right? Children needs father, mother. We need each other in that sense, and that's very important. That's the context. And so feminism is against that, and feminism is ultimately anti-mother, is what I call it. One of my favorite um, books to read, I, I like to read a lot of radical feminists. I love them. I, they're just so honest. It's refreshing. When I read Christian feminists, they're a bunch of liars. It's very difficult. I, so it's like I always prefer an honest pagan over a dishonest Christian. So one of my favorite ones is The Dialectic of Sex by Shulamith Firestone. And Firestone is like the crazy second waver out of the, uh, of the feminist. But she was just honest, is all she was. And uh, Firestone, this is what she says in her, uh, 
in the book, The Dialectic of Sex, page 72 for anyone online. Um, <clears throat> the heart of woman's oppression is her childbearing and child-rearing roles. So she goes on and she proposes a sexless future, like a sort of a brave new world sort of scenario where babies are grown in artificial wombs. And uh, she was tra treated as like the craziest of that group. But uh, guess what? She wasn't crazy. She's just very consistent and straightforward. If you read uh, Frieden and all the other ones, you'll catch, on, catch the same ideas there, a little more subtle. But Frieden really wanted women out of the home. She thought the home was this uh, drudgery to escape. So she creates this whole myth of, um, you know, this like all the housewives are depressed in the 50s. And I don't actually think the 50s housewife, I'll get to this, is ideal. But that idea there was like this mass depression and the women weren't happy, that's, that's something that Frieden just uh, sowed, again, discontent. Um, but she wasn't crazy. She just had the gift of vision. She knew what it would take to realize a truly feminist future. The destruction of what makes women unique, what makes them feminine. They have to become more like uh, a man. And so some people would say, well, no, Firestone really is crazy. Well, there's a 2007 uh, paper called The Moral Imperative for Ectogenesis. You know, just light reading, just something, you know, kicking back around the fireside. So I read it, and it was interesting. What is ectogenesis? Uh, ectogenesis is the artificial womb technology. And there's a paper in uh, Real Clear Science. Uh, there's a bioethicist, Sasha Isaac, and she writes, the technology could have important social benefits for women. So what are these social benefits for women? Well, it's anything outside of motherhood. She goes on and says, uh, if fetuses were to develop in artificial wombs, women would finally be free to pursue their interests and desires outside of their reproductive duties. Finally free from what? Free from motherhood. It's anti-motherhood. And just last year, there was a journalist, uh, Naomi Shalit, and she wrote an article entitled, Shulamith Firestone, Why the Radical Feminist who wanted to abolish pregnancy remains relevant. So why is she still relevant? Anyone want to take a guess? You can actually say, why, why is my Firestone still relevant to feminists today? Any guesses? Yeah? It's abortion. It's abortion. Modern America is built on a foundation of dead babies. Shallot explains, her work resonates with the principles of the reproductive justice movement, which demands the right not only to end an unwanted pregnancy, kill a human being, right, uh, but also to parent under conditions that allow both children and parents to flourish. In other words, feminism, what it really does, it's, it's, it's basically androgyny. So it reduces uh, manhood and womanhood down to roles and then divorces the roles away from a nature and then makes them interchangeable, where someone can take on the feminine role or the masculine role. And that's what it, someone asked, I was at a, someone asked this question about transgenderism at one of the early ones. That is something they share in common, is that they're ultimately androgynous in their uh, assumptions about the nature of human anthropology. So, uh, and then she ends with, what makes her book, this being Firestone's book, uh, worth returning to is its central recognition that the capacity to become pregnant is the ground upon which must, uh, much abuse and excuse me, inequality still operates. And that addressing this will require society to rethink in radical ways. Yeah, it is radical to depart from nature. It is radical to go against God's design. So anti-motherhood was and remains an essential component of the feminist vision of the world. It's just some feminists are more honest and consistent than others. Now, feminism hides the reality. This is uh, the main reality they hide, is that motherhood has a due date, right? Um, it's possible uh, for it to evaporate quicker than you ever expect. And it's a clock that runs down as each cycle uh, happens for a woman. When a woman's born, she has a, a set number of, of eggs. And the world uh, says, um, that's no biggie, right? Um, it's... it's, it's uh, no regrets if that happens, but th that's a lie. That's an obvious lie. Right, right now, it's, it's, it's incredible that you can build it like me. I've built a Twitter, a small Twitter account. It's like coming up on 10,000. I basically say, 
It's just common sense things, right? If Jordan Peterson wrote a book, he's like, make your bed, it changes the world. And that's be, common sense things are really hitting people hard because we live in a society committed to deception and lying about basic facts. And so when people hear basic facts, it, it revolutionizes their life. Um, and so the idea that you're not going to regret uh, not being a mother, that's, that's a deception. It's a lie. Um, I'm sure there's some sort of exceptional woman that's going to say, oh, I don't want to be a mother. You're, you're, you're damaged, right? Something's wrong, right? Just for a man that doesn't want to be a father. I'd say the same thing to, to men in that way. Uh, this is what we're made by God to do. Everything in a woman's nature pushes her towards this end, and to repress it requires intense social conditioning. And that's what we're in, going through right now. And this happens with two key lies. One, motherhood isn't normative. And two, even if it is, you can delay its pursuit without repercussion. And so, well, motherhood's normative. Well, what about the infertile people? What about them? Oh, yeah? What about the people with stillborn daughters that die? Right? Yeah, bad things happen. But those things are tragedies. That's not normal. We're not trying to normalize those things. When a woman is infertile, the reason you get all up in arms about it is obvious. It's because you don't want to be infertile. Because you're missing out on something. It's like someone that's colorblind. Right? Like he can still have a life, he can still go on, but there are certain shades of things that he will never experience. You know, I will not get to walk Nicaea down the aisle. It's not happening. Right? She's dead. I don't know what her hair will look like. Gal's hair is getting all wavy. She's got my Jew stuff going on. But I, I won't know that. And on Mother's Day sermons, we preach about the goodness of motherhood because we lost a daughter and we felt how precious it was. And you always have these people saying like that, oh, you shouldn't talk about how good motherhood is because of people that have miscarriages or stillbirths or are infertile. Quite the opposite, right? We should talk about how precious it is because how hard, how easy it can be stolen from you and lost and how hard we work to protect our children. Uh, it's very important. It's normative. And if you do, if you do not pursue it, there will be Repercussions, and these are, these are two lies that we stew in from the earliest of ages in America. They're, women are pushed towards careers constantly. Uh, the vocation of a, well, let me tell you about this. So I, if you haven't figured this out yet, um, I'm very conservative. I'm, I'm an Orthodox Presbyterian, subscribe to the Westminster Standards. You can look up what it is. I mean, that's like a 1600s doctrine, not ashamed of it all. I believe all the Bible. Every last word is inerrant. I'm not ashamed of one bit of it. I believe the only way anyone can be saved is uh, through Jesus Christ, right? He's the way, the truth, and life, and no one comes to the Father except I believe all that stuff. Patriarchal. Patriarchy is inevitable. You'll never escape it. I'll talk about it more in a moment. I believe all that stuff. That's the church background I've been in. So you would think careerism wouldn't sneak in there. But my wife was teaching a girls' group with some other women, and so basically... Uh, she would teach a session, and her mother would teach another session, and her mother would teach another session. Well, one of the sessions was on what do you want to be when you grow up? And no, no one talked about the goodness of motherhood there at all. And these women, these are otherwise good women. And that's like we absorb this stuff, osmosis, right? Like you don't even know how feministic you are. It's just like men. They don't understand how weak they are. You always hear these guys talking about, oh, I wish I was... Lived in the 1700s, dude, you would die. Give me a break. I don't know who you're, what you're kidding. I'm super glad I'm in 2020, okay? It's, I know it's a rough time, but uh, I like AC and I like automatic weapons. I think I stand a slight chance, you know? Um, I would just have to outrun Elliot, right? And like throw something in his eyes and ah. Um, but yeah, so the, even in that group, they were pushing women towards careers. And the vocation of wife and mother is ignored, deride, uh, derided, or treated as an optional add-on after years of a fulfilling career. Right? And you just add it on. And worse yet, they have taught them to compete with men. Right? You can do whatever a man can do. Right? Can you go downstairs when there's a bump in the middle of the night? Like, that would be the one advantage of having a feminist wife. Be like, hey... Sounds like there's a prowler outside. Will you go take care of that while I sleep? You know, <laughs> so. But uh, I, don't, I don't think that's 
they're inconsistent at that point. You can be an astronaut, a fireman, a CEO. Look, see, here's some examples. Look, uh, see their happy, smiley faces? Look how happy they are. The idea that women ought to compliment a man is missing from our, our education entirely. So women follow the course that they've been set on. Women have been lied to. They have been lied to. I, um, I focus my websites, it's good to be a man.com. And uh, we've started, it's, it's been growing, it's been crazy. Um, and I, I had women email me, and pastors ask me like, what to do about you know, women. I focused on men because to me, it seems like they're easier to fix because the deception with women is, is so intense. And, I, and I, I'm also here to push myself to get into this part of the conversation more, right? But it, you have been lied to at such a deep level, and the system is, is really jacked up right now. And, and it's like um, Christmas lights all balled up, right? Like trying to get this thing out straight. It's, it's going to be really hard. And so women do what they're told. They kick the can of marriage and family down the road so they can compete with men at the workplace, and uh, why shouldn't they? Everyone tells them they'll be happy and they can add family on later. I've worked in corporate America. Um, women do really well in corporate America. I will tell you, though, this is, not in, this is one of those things that's not in uh, the notes. My experience with women in corporate America is they tend to take on a, a sort of mothering way, or they like, are super brash masculine, guy, masculine women. They're always like challenging you. And I, I see women going into corporate America and into that sort of integrated workspace, and it, it's causing them to change. And it doesn't surprise me that women are struggling with prescription drug abuse, alcoholism at record rates. And it's not at parity with the men. It's growing in both sexes, but women are outpacing them. And I think they're being thrown into a scenario that's not good for them, that they don't really enjoy, and always trying to unsex yourself, right? Like Hamlet's wife. Uh, it, it takes a toll on one psyche, and I think it is, uh, big time. But the feminine reality is really different than what everyone tells them, especially post-30, 35, 40, the older you get. It's, it's very different than what they're telling, and, and people are waking up. The ability to conceive drastically diminishes as women age. Moreover, the number of candidates for marriage, like good men, uh, they drastically decrease, and the competition for those candidates go up because we all know that it's, it's not normal for a guy to marry an older woman, a significantly older woman. It doesn't happen that often. It does, but it's an exceptional case. But a woman marrying an older man, even a drastically older man, is something we see quite often in our social circles. And so now you, uh, you're not able to have children or it's getting harder to have children. And you're finding a, a guy that you would even want to bear his baby, right? It's not, it's not great. As a pastor... I look at the church and I look at the woman and I'm like, you're not really as great as you think you are. And I look at the men though and I'm like, but, you know, like, you're not, you're no prize either. And it's really, it's a really difficult time, you know, and that's the reality of what we're dealing with. Um, the struggle to find a husband is real and can be bleak. And um, I, I told my mom that when she was considering uh, my parents got divorced um, and much later in life, and I, I warned them about it. I said, you know, no one wants to marry you, right? Dad, no one wants to marry you, and Mom, no one wants to marry you, and no one's going to tell you that, and you're just going to see a lot of creepy people, and it's going to be really, you know, because they're like, at that point, they're in their late 50s, okay? And uh, I said, it'd be better to try to work this out at this stage. But there's all these, like, uh, basically divorce porn is what it is. So these movies where this woman, like, she, she's, like, straddled down with some loser guy, and she finally gets rid of him, and she's got the career world, and she finally gets the alpha male that likes it, and it all works out somehow, right? That's, there's a reason that's a movie, why that fantasy sells, is because a lot of women are feeling that pain right now and, and recognizing how difficult it is to find a good man, and they, they have made uh, choices that they're starting to regret. And, and my mom's going through it, and she, she admits to me that, that I was right. And I don't, I don't take joy in that. I want my mom to be happy. Um, poor decisions were made and done so on the basis of lies. 
the bleakness of the feminine situation must be explained away because it is too much to bear. Movies are made, books are written, sermons are preached, ministries are created, all to say that singleness is good. You're more than a mother. No regrets. Don't worry. Be happy. You're more than a mother. I always hear that. I'm always getting in trouble in church for attacking singleness, right? Well, singleness is a gift. No, it's not. It's a state of life. Celibacy is a gift. This is what Jesus talks about this in uh, Matthew 19. So celibacy is the ability to be single and satisfied with service to God alone. So what if your, your social or sexual drive that would normally find its uh, satisfaction in a, being married to the opposite sex, for whatever reason, God's gifted you that that's not a big problem. And you're able to serve the church. That's being celibate. If you want to be with the opposite sex, you don't have the gift of celibacy. Right? You're just single, and that's a temporary state for most of us. But they, always, they want to make single um, normative because the reality is that most evangelical churches are at least 60% or more female, and a lot of them are not, a lot of them are divorced, and a lot of them are single. And when women are upset in the church, it's kind of high drama, and it's very difficult. So these guys are trying to like cool everything down, not because they care deeply um, about your souls, but because uh, being stuck in the middle of upset women is, is miserable, okay? And they don't, they don't have the guts to do it. They don't have the guts to deal with it. And so they create all these ministries. And I did, uh, you know, when I write this stuff on single motherhood, and I have no hate against single mothers. Um, I, I want them to have a, the kids to have parents and then to get married. But I, I do tell guys, like, hey, be careful when you, you um you know, are considering marrying a single, a single mother. And I tweeted that out. I had like 13,000 comments on it, right? USA Today, Rand Paul's advisors, like, complaining. Allie Beth Stuckey's supposed to be a conservative. They're all coming after me. People trying to get me canceled at my job. My employer thought it was hilarious. Um, and it was, it was intense. I still have like 3,000 messages as my DM telling me I should die. So far, I'm still alive, so it's all right. Um, they've lost this battle. But they're acting like I was hating on the women. No, I was just saying it's, it's a broken relationship. And before you move in and become a father to someone else's son, you should understand what's the nature of the, of the actual father. It, does this woman really want to be with you? Or is she just really desperate for someone to bring protection to her and her child? You should think through these things. I, I tell the exact same thing to a woman considering marrying a man with a kid. Right? You're, what, what happened? But we can't say the truth, right? We can't say the truth about the brokenness of family situations. We can't talk about those things right now because it's, the pain's too much for people to bear, and they're just like sticking their hands in the sand. And the pastors are going along with it, and they're just terrible. And women will uh, may parrot these lines, but their nature is irrepressible. Um, in the Old Testament, barrenness is never good, and fruitfulness is always good, okay? Barrenness is a curse, a punishment. You just go to BibleGateway.com, stick in the word barren, stick in the word uh, fruitful, right? Go look it up yourself, find out. See how it's used in context. But uh, fruitfulness is good, and women love having babies. It's a big part of their life. So much so when Rachel sees Leah having all these kids, she looks at Jacob and says, give me children or I die. All right? Intense. But maybe you know the feeling, you know? Uh, Cyrene, my last daughter, she wasn't supposed to be here. But my wife cried one night that we should have more babies, and it got deep down in my soul, and Cyrene's here. So, but uh, it wasn't just, uh, it wasn't just uh, Rachel. Uh, uh, there's a great sadness, even madness, that falls upon women deprived of children. It drove Sarah to say, uh, here, sleep with my servant, so that I may have a child by her. Right? Sarah wanted a baby so much, even through a surrogate relationship, which is not good. And uh, you can think of Hannah. If you go to the book of 1 Samuel, you know, Hannah's like, oh, give me a child. She's weeping, and she's praying that God would give her a child. She says, look, if you give me a, a child, I'll give him to you. And that's where Samuel comes from. And he's actually raised up uh, by the priest. She, so she takes her son when he's weaned and gives him to the priest just so she could have a son. Well, there's one of my favorite lines in that. Elkanah's her husband, and he sees her crying, and he says to her, like, well, aren't I enough for you? 
And, and so she doesn't answer, but here's no. No husband, you're not. Women want children. It's part of it. And a woman deprived of children, uh, they can get really depressed and marriages can go really bad places. That's why I always tell men, if it has whiskers, it's not a baby, right? It's not your child, <laughs> right? Your dog, like if we crashed on an island and there's like my kid and there's like your dog and we're starting to char- like starve, I just eat your dog, okay? I eat your baby. You know, I'm going to, they're not children. They're pets. And so when you first get married, I always tell people, don't, don't get a cat, don't get a dog, right? Make love. Let it be fruitful. Have a child. That's, what, that's why you're being driven to have some little thing to take care of. And it brings the marriage together tight. Well, don't you want time to be yourself? What does that even mean? Who else can you be? That's stupid, right? That's an Instagram post, but it's retarded, man. No, you'll find out who you are by children, okay? It's a refiner's fire. It will bring you and your wife closer together. I always, I always think, Emily and I, I think of like those trees that have grown around fences, like the fence is going through the tree. That's Emily and I. We've been together so long. We've had these kids. We've gone through some pretty intense things and where she ends and I began and so forth. We've, we've grown together, right? Start growing together as soon as you can. Embrace fruitfulness. It's good. Children are a gift. They're wonderful. It shouldn't surprise us again that alcohol abuse, drug abuse, mental illness is exploding among women. Women are unhappy, and it's easy to see that they manage this unhappiness uh, by, by medicating and just living in denial. And it's, uh, it's, the reality is hurtful, and the pain's too much. So feminism has lied. Feminism has failed. It didn't lead to freedom. It led to a prison, and that's why we want to destroy it. Not because we don't like women, because we love women. That's why I hate feminism, right? It must, we must get rid of it. And that's why I'm willing to come to a conference like this and speak. It's not my normal venue, to say the least. Um, and anyone seeking to wake up women to help them to face the reality of their situation will be resisted and demonized, right? You know, and if you've, the majority of the stuff I've heard here has been very positive towards women, right? It's been, uh, fe- femininity has been held up high, not diminished at all. And God's design, as laid out in Scripture, is, is the surest path to happiness. Marriage and motherhood are good. Men aren't the competition. Sex exists, sex is, exists to complement each other. So don't, don't kick the can down the road. Embrace the goodness of your femininity right now. And, uh, and you can miss out. You really can. And you don't want to do that. So where, where do you start? Well, how about this? How about Proverbs 31, right? Someone brought it up earlier. It's a very important uh, chapter for women in the Bible, but it's actually not written to women. Uh, It says, right, the words of King Lemuel, the oracle which his mother taught him, right? This is his mom telling the queen mother saying, this is the sort of woman you want to get, right? And and Proverbs 31 actually has two women, has two different women. And, uh, the first one comes up in uh, verse 3. She says to her son, Do not give your strength to women or your ways to which destroys kings. And so this is the first woman. I'll call her the consumer. And the second one, we'll call her the producer. And there uh, is a, w- a type of woman that is a predator, right? She is a consumer. And, and the mother, she knows these type of women. And you women know these. Women are meaner than women than men are mean to women at least in my experience. I, look, I, this friend of mine in basketball practice, he called me a name. And I was like, oh, you wouldn't say that to my face. You wouldn't whisper it here. And I did that because he's really big, and I was smaller back then. And I punched him in his face, right? And uh, we actually weren't friends yet. He's just a guy. And we're like really good friends the next day. And we're like, guys, guys, this is how we sort out the hierarchy. So then um, we have those three boys, and we're trying to come up with girl names. And I'm like, what about this name, Emily? And she's like, nah, I don't like the name. Why? What's, what's a good name? What's wrong with Well, there's this girl, like, back in fourth grade. I'm like, fourth grade? What are you talking about? <laughs> well, what about this name? Well, there's this other girl. I'm like, man, chicks, they hold grudges, <laughs> like, like, for a long time. And we just beat, guys just beat, beat the hell out of each other, and then it's over. But women, oh, cross a woman, they, they destroy each other. That's the goal, right? It's, it's intense. And... And so this is that sort of woman that 
is a consumer. You don't want to give your strength to her because it's, it's, it's throwing good money after bad. It's pouring water into the Sahara Desert, right? You're, it's not going to come back to you at all. The, the consumer uh, is someone that saps the energy of the man. She uses her sexuality to capture a fool and reorientates him to her mission. She's a man-eater. Right? There's that old 80s song that I keep thinking of. Um, but you can go to Proverbs chapter 7, and they describe what this woman's like. And Solomon warns his son to avoid the man-eater, and, and so does Solomon's wife. And he says, um, keep your way far from her, or strangers will be filled with your strength, and your hard-earned goods will go down to the house of an alien when your flesh and your body are consumed. So the defining trait of the consumer is that she destroys households. So Proverbs 2.18, for her house sinks down to death. Proverbs 5.26, her house is the way to Sheol, or the place of death. Proverbs 14.1, the wise woman builds her house, but the foolish woman tears it down with her own hands. Have you known women like that, that have destroyed their family, have pulled it down? Right? Can we admit that they exist? Can you admit that you could be that? Right? Men can be bad men. Men can be good men. Women can be horrible. Right? The fall, the sin that happened in the first, the affected both sex. You're not little angels. You're a sinner like me. I don't need to make women worse. We're all screwed without God's forgiveness. We all have a sin nature, and you see it manifest itself in terrible ways. So this isn't about hating on women. This is about being honest about the way sin manifests itself in women differently than men. We both have sin, and it shows itself differently. And uh, the consumer will tear down a house. What is she? She's a self-focused, independent woman. Now, think about, why would, I, why would a man want to enter into a relationship with someone that's going to be independent? What is the nature of a marriage covenant? Isn't it for two to become one to join? Why would there be an independent? That's not a good thing. No one wants an independent woman. Matter of fact, I tell guys that if you want to know how to be a man, just follow the advice that they put in women's magazines, right? Like, it's really good man advice. It's, it's pretty crappy woman advice. Um, that's the truth. And that's what brings me to what I think would be the clearest indicator uh, of, of a consumer type of woman, a bad woman, and that she is loud. She's a loud woman. She's... This is Proverbs 7, 1. She is loud and stubborn, and her feet do not stay at home. This is the type of woman you must avoid becoming, right? That's the type of woman that will destroy a man. This is um, from some commentary. A loud woman is not necessarily the one who speaks with too much volume. The Hebrew word can be translated as boisterous or tumultuous. It speaks of turbulence or commotion. It's meant to bring to mind the roaring wind of a storm. Therein we find a good metaphor for a loud woman. She's like a storm. She's full of unruly energy. She yields only to her own purposes. And the definition of a loud woman comes further in focus when we consider how loud and stubborn is paralleled with her feet do not stay at home. This woman in Proverbs 7, she has a husband. And she's supposed to be submitted to his mission, but he's away on work. And she, she's calling another man saying, hey, my husband's away. You know what she also does? I, she also says, hey, I've made my offerings. She, she like, talks about how spiritual and she is religious. I, I'm not, I know better. I know a lot of the good Christian girls in our churches. I know what they're doing. I understand that a lot of women can be spiritual and religious and, all, and have terrible ethics and morals and be living in an ungodly way. It's very common, actually. And that's this woman, too, but she's very, very loud. Matthew Henry, he puts it this way, by her place, not her own house, she hates the confinement and employment of that. Her feet abide not there any longer than needs must. She is all for gadding abroad, changing place and company. Now is she without in the country, under pretense of taking the air. Now in the streets of the city, under pretense of seeing how the market goes, she is here and there and everywhere, but the very place she should be. She lies in wait at every corner to pick up such as she can make a prey of. Virtue is a penance to those whom home is a prison. Powerful, right? The loud woman hates the home because the home represents submission to a will besides her own. 
Therefore, she prowls for a fool who will help her achieve her end. Commenting on uh, Proverbs 7.10, the verses prior to the one I quoted, there's a great commentary by Keel and Dillich. And they say, um, they explain the motives of this brazen type of woman. Uh, she is of a hidden mind, of a concealed nature, for she feigns fidelity to her husband and flatters her paramours as her only beloved, while in truth she loves no, none. And each of them is to her only a means and end to the indulgence of her worldly sensual desires. Yeah, women will use men to go on an adventure, to have a good time, to, to consume their resources, right? Kanye's crazy sometimes, but he was right about gold diggers. They're a real thing. They do exist. No, no mother wants her son to marry a woman like this. No mother wants a son to give his masculine strength to a woman that's just going to consume it, and he'll get nothing back. So she warns him. This is the words of a woman warning her son, stay away from that. I do that all the time with my kids. I, like the joggers in my neighborhood, like they should just run naked. I don't know why they don't. I don't understand. What is it? Do they, like, is it like spray on, or what's it going on? I'm like, son, look, women that run around that way have no self-respect. Right? They're making themselves voyeuristic. It's almost certainly showing that they have daddy issues. I, don't, I, I want you to look for a woman that has respect for herself and that carries herself in a modest way. Right? I have to warn my sons. I warn my daughters, too. They're little right now. Right? But uh, I, I warn them as they age. They're, women can be predators. Don't, don't be that sort of woman. Right? So the consumer reduces her femininity down to mere sex. Essentially, she transactualizes her bed to take from the man. No matter what she promises, she is a flatterer. She's merely using the man for his stuff, and she is a gold digger. Now, the producer is very different. This is the good woman, right? So I want to read this to you. You didn't know you are going to church, did you? You are. An excellent wife, who can find? For her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She looks for wool and flax, and her works with her hands in delight. Or she, excuse me, she looks for wool and flax and, her, and works with her hands in delight. She is like a merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. From her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. She stretches out her hands to the distaff, and her hands grasp the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor, and she stretches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for her, all her household are clothed with scarlet. She makes coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates where he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. Strength and dignity are her clothing. She smiles at the future. She opens her mouth in wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and bless her, her husband also. And he praises her saying, many daughters, have done nobly, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands, and let her works praise her in the gates. That is a good woman. Her, fem her femininity is mature. She possesses both feminine virtues and skills. I'll give you five real quick. One, uh, her rarity. Right? This, she's uh, like a, a rare jewel. She's rarer than a jewel. She's very precious. A lot of women don't choose this path. Right? Maybe you didn't when you were younger. You're still here. There's still time. Right? You can slide in the home you know, plate really hard. <laughs> but a lot of women don't choose this way. A lot of men don't choose being masculine, being patriarchs, being a worthy man. It doesn't have to be you, though. It doesn't. Right? Be the rare one. Be the exception in that way. Her trustworthiness, the underlying theme of all life and all her work, when you look at it, she, she can be depended on. And a deceptive woman, women, uh, because you don't deal with your conflict through fists, right, 
you, you deal with it through your tongue, through words. And when you get to the New Testament, and it's not that guys don't lie and whatever, but in the New Testament, when Paul is, is warning uh, pastors about feminine sets of sins, he always brings up gossip and slander and, and, and talk. And uh, you want to be a woman that people trust. You want to be a woman that keeps your word, that doesn't engage in gossip and slander. It's really hard with social media. We know a lot about people that you don't. It's not your business, man. Right? It's not your business. Who cares? Right? And you want to you wanna be a trustworthy woman. Then the other thing is her industry. This is a big one. She is industrious. This chick gets things done. It says uh, she, she works willingly. She goes to great lengths. Right? It's like she's waking up really early. It's still night. Uh, no matter what, this woman's working very hard. I don't think of women as just like sitting around doing little tasks. Women can do great things. And that's this woman. She gets all sorts of things done. She manages her time well. She manages her money well. She manages her skills. Uh, she's, she's able to look at a property and say, this is a good property. I'm going to buy it with the money my husband gave me. Uh, she cultivates strength. There's such thing as feminine strength, right? I've been there. For every time my kids were born, it's horrific, right? A little person coming out of it, it's like, it's not it's scary. But women are strong. And they can do incredible things, but not just in childbirth. Right? Women are able to uh, do incredible things like we see with the CEOs and, and all, all those sorts of uh, tasks. Like No one's denying that women are, women are capable. And this woman's very capable. But we'll, we'll come back to how this is a little bit different in a second. Um, her love would be her fourth one. And she has an intense love for her household and for her servants. Right? And this, this household has servants. She cares about them. She uh, makes sure that they're all dressed well. You know, like, I saw, I remember once I saw an episode of Family Guy. It's not a show I usually watch, but Lois goes to jail for some reason, and Stewie is, like, walking into the room with a diaper that's full. He's like, Peter, Peter, please change me, you know? Sometimes us guys, we can just overlook, like, yeah, he looks fine, you know? Um, but, you know, moms are making sure they look nice and have good clothes, and they're keeping tabs of that. And, and this woman loves her household, her servants, and everybody. She loves her husband. Um, she frees him from some of his duties so he can be at the gates. The gates in the ancient world is where judgments would be rendered. So when you're a respected man, you go sit at a gate, and then people with, uh, with a problem would come and get your wisdom. And so this guy, uh, this is later in life. So this is at the end of a woman's life. So this woman clearly uh, is well, she's developed these skills, but enough to free her husband to be uh, involved in public office. So she has this great love for her husband. She also loves the poor, right? She, she cares deeply about the poor. She loves instruction. She wants to learn. She wants to be corrected, you know? Um, that was the hardest part of our early marriage. The first three years, we tried to kill each other for a while. Um, a lot of broken lamps and whatever. And I remember just trying to get my wife to admit that she could be wrong was difficult. And I, I used to tell her, like, did, did Jesus die for you? Or just the rest of the world, you know? Um, but uh, we get in these arguments. And I remember one night I decided that I was going to correct her. And I wouldn't give up till I won, right? It's like the guy jumping on the back of, like, a wild horse. You're like, I'm going to hold on. I'm going to break this horse. And so we argued for, like, hours into the morning. And I won. But it was like Rocky II. At the end of Rocky II, Apollo Creed and Rocky beat the hell out of each other for 12 rounds, and they knock each other both down. And then whoever gets up first wins. I got up first, and I won. <laughs> it was the start of Emily being willing to admit, like, yeah, she, she can be wrong. And, and uh, I know she can be right. I need her to show me that she can be wrong. She likes to be instructed by me. She likes to ask me things. And this is a woman that can receive instruction. If you can't be corrected, man, I, I would warn everyone, stay away from that woman. She can't ever admit she's wrong. That's a terrible person. And so the last thing, so the last one was her love. And then the second, the. I just want, did I lose my sound? No, okay. Uh, the, the, the last thing is she has a reward. Um, she's, she's honored. She's honored through her family. She's honored through her Lord. And she's honored through the work herself. So I said this is a woman as producer. And what she does is her husband gives her strength, and she takes it and multiplies it. That's what women do. They multiply the strength of a man. That's why you don't want a weak man. Right? You're like, there's not much to work with. And I always think about, like, I think about uh, how we make people, 
how a guy gives a woman a little bit of semen, and she turns that into a person. It's amazing, right? It's amazing, right? Uh, but, um, but not just that. A man brings home some flour, and she makes bread. A man gives her some money, and she buys a vineyard. Women are multipliers. So men are looking for good ROI, return on investment. And that's what the mother's saying. Find a woman that if you give her strength, you get back. And women are crazy when they, uh, when they have babies. Like, they turn into efficiency machines. Like, they like, go through this incredible change, and they're able to get all these things done. And I remember after our first kid, I, I had to work harder to keep up with Emily. And, you know, she's just on a mission. And so women as producers is, is amazing. And the thing with households that we don't get, and I want to talk about this very quickly. I don't have much time left. But um, when we think of a household, we don't think of a biblical household. We think of a, like a, a place where we watch Netflix and maybe have people over every once in a while. A household is everything. It's, it's the servants here. It includes her servants, the property, the influence, all that. I always remind people, Abraham's household was able to go to war with four kings. He had 300 servants. Um, so she is not a careerist. She's not, this isn't a career away from her family. She and her family are working together. The Industrial Revolution changed the nature of the home. It removed productivity out of the home and went into the factories. And so work became something slowly that happened outside of the home, where it used to always be in the home. And so should men and women work together? Yes, in the home, right? Children should work with their, their mother and father, and that's how it used to be. And as it's separated over time, it's become more and more problematic. And now that the home's been gutted of everything, it's been gutted of its productivity first, but now it's gutted of its, of its uh, place of education, where moms used to be educators, you know, I'm not a hardcore homeschooler. I, I think it's really good. I certainly would not encourage public school. But my, my wife is educated in all our kids. She does a, a fine job. But home used to be a place of discipleship. It used to be a place of hospitality. Architecture has changed, where now dining rooms are small. No one comes over anymore. You go to a restaurant instead. But it, home used to be the locus of everything. And women used to be over that and have that influence. Very different than a 1950s housewife as machines were created to wash dishes, whatever, it, it, it didn't fulfill a woman, right? I, I actually see what they're talking about because women are that capable. So we, to, to take down feminism, we have to make the home productive again. We have to change, like, my wife is shaping the world, okay? We're building big things. We're doing it together. I can say like Xenophone, without my wife, I would die, right? Our vision is so big that I need her. And so I get why women are struggling with staying at home because it's just Netflix and chill. But that's not what Scripture is talking about. It's a crazy time. We can actually reclaim the home because of the Internet. Because now through the Internet, you can do things like fulfillment by Amazon and sell on eBay. Every dude here has seven books and eight courses for you to go through, right? Um, I have none. I, I should find a better way to make money, I guess. Um, but uh, you can do those things, and you can sell them from your home. You can bring industry back into your home again in a way that hasn't happened before. With remote work, we're able to uh, get away from the cities, which is good, because Black Lives Matter is burning the place down. Um, so a husband provides the raw goods, and the wife multiplies them. She magnifies her husband's name, Foster, through her work and our children. We're making more of us. We're taking over. Liberals don't have enough kids. They're all, they're all going to work for my kids eventually, and one of them will be emperor of the world. Um, the producer is much more than a housewife and some quasi-50 cents. She manages the household and expands its borders. Consequently, the husband can be about the business outside the home and then get a lot of things done. This is, this is the vision of femininity in scripture. This is the vision we've lost. This is what feminists hate. They think the home is a prison. It's not a prison. It's a launch pad for all society. Society is a collection of households. And if the basic building block has been destroyed, then society is going to fall. And that's what's happening. We have to be men. And we have to be women. And we have to come together and have children and marriage and build this up. This is 
our task. This is what we're working at right now. So when we say make women you know, great again, we're trying to make society great again. We can't do that without you ladies. So that's my challenge for you. And I count it a privilege to speak to you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have four minutes to talk about uh, why you need to forgive your mother. <laughs> Anybody? Any questions? Are we all ready for wine and dinner? I'm sure it won't be awkward at all. You know, interesting is a code word. Interesting is a code word. It is. It always means someone disagrees, but go on. I want to hear. No, it's very interesting. You're not the one that I disagree with. Okay. Um, That's good. The, the idea that uh, industry, uh, we have the term cottage industry. So all of these things happened in the home. We made clothes, shoes, metalworking, every, all of this stuff happened in the home. And it makes me think that this is what the feminist hard line is coming from when they say that marriage is slavery. Because there's no way you can logically conclude that having a Roomba clean for you is somehow drudgery. Okay. So they're pulling from some truth. Do you, do you think that if this was something that was to become more of a reality, that um, women today would even be prepared to do that kind of work. You think you that you work really hard going to school for four, six, ten years, but do you really have the strength to do what the milkmaids did two hundred years ago? Uh, maybe not, right? But you gotta start somewhere. Right? Like everyone has all these excuses that they won't have the ideal. But you have to you have to start and you build where you're at. Look, we can't fix this. This we can't fix this in this generation. We're just trying to, to get the ball down the field and hand it to the next generation. That's why you have to have an intergenerational uh, vision for your family. If you can fulfill your vision in your life, you, your vision's too small. And I, I, I need grandkids to get this done. So Emily and I, when we were dating, we decided we'd have, we wanted 25 people to come from us, right? We're working on it. So if grandkids are gonna fulfill it, like, Enough kids right now, so anyway. Okay. Hopefully this won't be awkward. Um, Bring it. Thank you for the information you've shared with us today. Um, I'm not sure what the population of the world was when the Old Testament was written or when the New Testament was written. I might have an idea about what the population is now, but it seems like there are a lot of people and there might be an initiative to not have babies. So I think I have three children. Motherhood is great. I don't know if I'll ever have grandbabies because of the way things are right now. So could you speak to population um, sure. control issues? Yeah, it's a lie. Perhaps? Okay. You can fit uh, all of America standing in a space, I think in the Jacksonville, right? I mean, middle of America's, you can so much open space. Uh, so I, I don't, I don't buy it. Uh, also, you know, not everyone has lots of kids. This isn't me saying you have to have the absolute most kids you can. Um, by today's standards, three kids is a lot, actually. How is it going to keep sliding? You know. Uh, so this idea. Also, uh, we're the baby boomers are dying off, and one of our biggest problems right now is the replacement uh, rate in the West. One reason Social Security and Medicaid probably failed is because we killed all those babies. When they were working out that formula, it, it, it had a replacement rate that didn't happen because of abortion. And so our problem is we need more people. Not this idea, uh, I would challenge anyone to prove it. <laughs> like, how, many, how, how much can the planet take? And so you can go back to that old book, The Population Bomb or whatever, back in the 70s. This is being thir thoroughly discredited. So, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not an anthropologist or a sociologist. I'm a pastor. I can speak from scripture and from experience. But uh, what I've seen uh, sold as uh, the problem of overpopulation, I've found scientifically and intellectually unpersuasive. So that'd be my answer. So have more, 
have two more kids. Um, Congratulations on your babies. I think that's really great to have that many. Um, my grandmother is the, was the wisest woman I ever met, and um, she started taking care of her siblings when she was 12 because her mother died. Then she got married and had 11 children of her own. Wow. And um, there was a whole lot more than 25 when we met at her house. <laughs> We only had three, but if, uh, and I wanted six, but that didn't happen. And um, from those three, we have nine grandchildren. Congratulations. And we have in-laws. So that my house was built to have big dinners. And uh, right now, if just some of them come, I, I have, um, six at one table and ten at another and uh, then we have people standing around to eat so um, y you can my grandmother said we don't look at the big picture and one thing my grandmother said and I think women especially feminists lost this the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world if women stay home and take care of their children instead of going to work outside the home and um, letting somebody at the daycare raise them, then you will have influence on your children. And I just think that we need to get back to that sort of thing. Um, Absolutely. I mean, this, so I ran this by my wife before, not because I need her permission, but because I want her wisdom. I was like, here's what, here's what I think I'm going to do today. I rewrote this this morning, so I knew it was either going to be really good or really bad. So I, oh, don't tell me. I don't want to know. But, um, but I, I run a buyer. So yeah, my wife has intense influence through me. And I trust her. And women have, always have influence through her husband and other men. It's significant. So, hey, you're going to work for the patriarchy. You get that, right? There's no stopping this. You, if you work for a CEO at a company, it's 95% of the time it's a man. Most of the small business owners are men, right? You're building up their name. And, when, and I fired people when I worked for corporate America. I had to, or they moved on. I'm like, oh, she was a great woman. I miss her, or whatever. Then I move on. If my wife dies, it's going to leave a hole in my family. So what do you, what do you want? Do you, do you want to give your life to some faceless corporation, to that form of the patriarchy, an emaciated household, boiled down to this is revenue producing? Or do you want to have influence through your husband and your children and your neighbors and in your community? And that woman in Proverbs 31 is not just locked to her house. Right? She's very So you're going to, there's no way getting around this. The patriarchy of patriarchy. It's existed and it still doesn't. Me and the red pill don't see eye to eye on that one. But uh, ma'am. Okay. I'm I'm going to ask Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm going to ask you this and it's not to be um, like confrontational, yes. So earlier we saw a slide, 60 million abortions since 1979, I think. Um, and since you said you were conservative, and most of us in this room, I'm going to assume, are conservative as well. We're on a press pass. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what the problem that I see is if we didn't have the 60 million abortions, then we have these 60 million unwanted babies, unhealthy, um, whatever demographic, whatever income they're coming from. So it could have, it did save taxpayers this money having to take care of these unwanted babies. But if we didn't have the 60 million abortions and we had these babies and then conservatives say they don't want to pay for these unwanted babies, so how do we fix that? How, how do we have unwanted babies still bring them into the world and take care of them? Be 
because it comes <laughs> our responsibility. Okay. Uh, it's, it's a fair question. Um, my answer uh, for it would, I mean, first off, we have to decide we're not going to murder people. Right? We, they're people, and we can't kill them. We have to stop there. It's, it's bad to kill people. Stop it. Right? Any person, don't kill them. I know. What about capital punishment? Yeah, a baby's equal to a criminal. Sure. That's not the same thing. That's moral equivocation. That's a weak argument. We can blow right through that stuff. Uh, but the reality is um, they, there's an assumption that all, all of them are unwanted, right? And that's an assumption that we can't demonstrate. It was just they were scared into it sometimes. And what if uh, we had the extended family would be part of it, where we have support groups that will come and help these people. Also, uh, don't have sex before you get married. Stop it, right? Have sex in marriage and raise those kids up in marriage. And having sex outside of marriage leads to a lot of abortion. I'm a Christian pastor. I don't know what, what else you think I'm going to say here. I think it's fornication. It's a sin. It's bad. And it creates something like abortion. Like, uh, it, it's, it's sacrificing babies so you can have a happy life. So the way you can have a happy life and we can save some taxes and we can kill a bunch of babies. You go to an abortion clinic. Behind them is a dumpster. In that dumpster is bio waste. And by bio waste, we mean blood, Baby hands, baby heads, all that stuff, right? It's disgusting. But, um, but we, uh, we have to be not just against abortion. We have to be pro-family. We have to help these people. I, I protested at abortion clinics for a long time. And yes, we would adopt those babies. We adopt them all the time. Christians love to adopt babies. And apparently, if you're a Supreme Court justice, it's still not good enough to adopt them. But... Uh, but yeah, we have to be willing to adopt them. We have to be willing to support them. We have to be uh, willing to come around uh, marriages that are falling apart and encourage them to keep them. I can think of these guys, they would drive into the abortion clinic with the, a woman, and the guys would come out front, and I'd say, look, man, you need to go in there and tell her, I will take care of your child, right? Go do it. Oh, she's just, she doesn't, you know, she's not listening. I was like, you got to do it, man. You know, you know Liam Neeson and all those movies? He's like, I got these skills. I'm going to protect my daughter. You're not Liam Neeson. You're the bad guy. Liam Neeson goes in there. And you tell that murderer, that abortionist, to get your hands off my wife. Right? Protect your babies. We have to, we have to face it down. But here's the thing. With all these problems, we don't always have easy solutions. And that doesn't mean we do nothing. We do what we can, and we work towards it. We admit that there are uh, systematic problems. There's, like, there's huge problems right now that our country is basically built on uh, abortion and contraceptive so much so. Uh, it's the only way that allows two income families to happen. If Roe v. Wade was abolished, there'd be major ramifications for our economy. That's a problem. You know, it's, it's a crazy thought. And I want it to go away, but we, we've built, we've built some, some issues here that we have to work through. So we start looking for a solution. You know. Also, when I said conservative, I meant theologically conservative, though I do tend to vote. OK. I'm very conservative. I'm right of whoever in here thinks they're Now, you're right. not going to comment on her, are you? Because uh, this is a question and answer time. I was just going to tell okay. a story. All right, let's hear the story. But it's a comment on what she said in 1979. We adopted our daughter. She was four. I had to wait to get her until she was abused. And um, the whole time, from the time she was born until she was four, I was trying to adopt a baby. And there weren't any because they killed them all. And the garbage men in Phoenix, Arizona, found a dumpster behind a Planned Parenthood place and they refused to take the dumpster away because it was full of babies. And I just pulled over to the side of the road and bowed my head and cried and said, God, I only wanted one. Let me tell you, there's no such thing as an unwanted child. I am 70 years old and today, if they would let me, I would adopt another one. Thank you for sharing that. Well, just to close it up, I, I just would say that men can do cold abstractions. 
Uh, women aren't very good at cold uh, abstractions. And when you give yourself to anti-motherhood, two things like abortion, it, it has major ramifications to your soul. And it makes you shrill, and it makes you hard. And the world needs your femininity. It needs your good softness brought into it. And we can't lose that. So anyway, thank you so much. We can win this war. We can win this war? OK, well, joining us from Orlando, Florida, is the man in that clip, Anthony Dream Johnson, who says he wants to abolish feminism and make women great again. No, but it also crazy. says, with a trademark, make women great again. Full women are always, always great. great. Right. Make women great again. But they're going to do a three-day seminar for women led by all men. <laughs> in mansplaining news, a three-day conference for women led by men hopes to make women great again. How the 22 convention will make you the greatest you ever. Raise your femininity by 500%. First of all, how is a man supposed to tell a woman how to be the ultimate woman? Well, women need to be taught how to be great again. Oh, not my yes, words. We do. Like how to land a husband, <gasps> how to lose weight, how to pop out a bunch of kids. Why do men think they need to fix the problems of women? Well, it says the world's ultimate event for women. Yeah, Orlando, Florida, that's going to be the scene of the crime. It's mansplaining palooza and say no to the toxic bullying feminist dogma. <laughs> Taught by men to make women great again. Taking the stage now is the founder of the 22 Convention. You're in for a treat, Mr. Anthony Dream Johnson. Anthony Dream Johnson. Anthony Dream Johnson. The first president of the Manosphere. It's run by all men, Surprise. which promises to, quote, make women great again. This course is guaranteed to raise your femininity by 500%. Together, we will make women great again. Excuse me, I'm mansplaining here. She said there's nothing...